This is Game Theory, a podcast about competition, strategy, and decision-making, hosted by me, Nick Andrews, and my brother, Chris. In this episode, we find love on TV. Probably not. In March of 2002, the TV phenomenon called The Bachelor debuted on ABC. Since then, reality TV documentaries and television dating competitions have entertained many millions of people across the U.S. and the world. But beyond the intrigue of America's hottest single people on The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, shows like 90 Day Fiancé and Sister Wives have sparked conversations about what kind of love and relationships are out there that may be off the beaten path. Now, with the advent of streaming services like Netflix, the genre is hotter than it's ever been. But does it work? What's the benefit? What's the issue? In this episode of Game Theory, we break down the competition shows like The Bachelor and Love is Blind and the documentary shows like 90 Day Fiance and Sister Wives. And welcome to episode 56 of Game Theory, a podcast about competition, strategy, and decision-making, hosted by me, Nick Andrews, and my brother, Chris, as I like to say at the beginning of episodes. And Chris, we plan these episodes weeks, nay, months in advance. However, we like to record them so that we can add in recency stuff. And as a result of that, I am in California, and you are sick, and so people are going to have to bear with us. We have a playoff effort here. This is Michael Jordan flu game happening today. Yeah, except the consequences literally couldn't be any lower. I mean, Jordan playing in the finals earth-shattering stuff. He's one of the greatest athletes of all time. We are some of the podcasters of all time, and this is just another episode. Uh, but we love doing this show, yeah. and we're, we're here. We're here excited. We're excited about the topic. The, look, the reason we do this stuff is because we find this stuff really, really interesting to talk right. about. Every single week when we come at you with a new topic, it's because somebody told us about cool stuff, or we found out about it by accident by ourselves, and we're just psyched to do it. So we're going to perform despite our geographic distances from our normal home bases despite our various infirmities and you know we'll congratulate each other on the sacrifices later on yeah and i'll be honest um this is part of the deal this is part of the part of being with us is that they can't all right. be um home runs but they can sometimes you hit a hit a hit a pop fly and it goes out which is what, what's going to happen today so the topic today right. is the dunning kruger thing a paradox effect idea wikipedia page whatever i think effect is the most common yes i've only ever heard it called the dunning kruger effect and for those of you who are terminally online i think that term carries uh, a certain amount of freight but you have to be kind of in the discourse to know about that and i only know about that because i have friends who are in the discourse and like dunning kruger is kind of like one of those weird dog whistly words that draws out some of the worst people who know a little bit too much so that they're dangerous but not enough to actually inform or enlighten those around them so we're going to be talking about that today what did you just say they're in the what they're, they're, like like people who are online, like who are in, in the, the discourse. discourse. Does the discourse, come the discourse, with like a membership card. I, I mean, basically, yeah, it comes with like a oh. certain number of tweets per day, a certain number of likes per tweet. Mm. It's a, it's a very it's like capital D discourse. Like if you Google the discourse, <laughs> it's it's. I, I mean, people I think kind of use it more offhandedly or mm. uh, dismissively or whatever else. I don't know. I guess some people participate it, but. How yeah, the hell would I, I know about that? No, I observe. I am a consumer of the discourse. I'm not a creator of the discourse. And ergo, Chris, well, we, we do create our own little content here, which is, speaking of that, you can watch this, this, is, this on this YouTube. This is part of the discourse. Yeah, Th no, This is not. to the discourse what our normal phone calls with each other <laughs> are to the discourse. Yeah, we used to talk like this all the time. For um, This podcast essentially got started years ago playing Xbox Live, where Chris occasionally mm -hmm. would divert just to get into a really aggressive, vulgar match with someone who is between the age of 12 and 90 um, anywhere, in the world, anywhere, anywhere in the world. And now here we are, we have a podcast. Chris, it's available on YouTube, and we have a YouTube comment from our Southwest Airlines episode. Um, don't usually read YouTube comments, uh, but this one said, Southwest Airlines is the Florida of airlines, and I thought about that for a <laughs> long time. I thought about that for a long time. Because I was like, you know, Florida, there's a lot of people and there's a lot of good. And I was like, Southwest was like, were, Wall Street Journal had him number one for a while. I, like, That's, I, I pondered that, that observation. It was, not, it, was not a, it was not a bad effort. I liked that one quite a bit. I feel like the biggest winner out of all of this is Spirit Airlines. Because mm -hmm. Spirit Airlines is like notoriously bad. Like there's a reason their flights are always cheaper. All the videos you see of like people getting picked, kicked off of planes for yeah. like fighting with the flight attendants and yes. like berating fellow bad. Like, all those are on Spirit Airlines. So I feel like, you know, Southwest being called the Florida of the skies is uh, 
not inaccurate, and I think it's a huge favor to mm -hmm. Spirit Airlines. It must so, be like one of their PR people. Interestingly, I think this could eventually segue to where we want to go as we meander through a topic here, but I think it's really an interesting marketing tactic when you have a, a, an inferior product to just be like, Dude, it's an inferior product. Like, take it or leave it. So this is – McDonald's did research years ago. Do you remember the mixed salad where you put the dressing in and you shake a salad? And people oh, yeah. shake salads, right? Well, they did research on that. And everybody, like, you don't put – the way to mix salad into a salad or salad dressing into a salad is to shake it. So it makes a ton of sense, right? Like, this is a good way to do this. Sure. They did, a, they did market research after doing that for a year or two. And the people, the consultants who consulted and then told them, they were like, hey, uh, your customers don't fucking want healthy food bro. So let's just cut this out. And so now you just lean into who you are. We know, I know that McDonald's is gross. If I am making the decision to get McDonald's, I'm either hungover or very close to rock bottom. Yeah. It's, it, I'm not trying to supplement my healthy lifestyle with products from also right. my favorite fast food. Like, no, just let me be who I am, where I am. Don't try to be everything everywhere all at once. Right. Market movie, research, I'm huge component of that, obviously. It, it, yeah, yeah. It is a great movie. I've seen yeah. bits and pieces of it. I haven't moved really that. I have a movie review for you that we'll do later in this episode. But just like McDonald's, Spirit Airlines, to your point, is buying into who they are. They're like, hey, you know, you might get punched in the face. Uh, most people here will be wasted, but at least you won't get your – they don't have your expectations high, and it'll be fine. And you go on – I've had Spirit and Frontier Airlines flights, and it's been fine. I mean, it sucked, but it was – I knew it would suck, and it was cheap, and it was worth 100 bucks. Like, totally fine. Yeah. You fly across the country with no bags, no personal space, and no sense of decorum for $37. I mean, honestly, at a certain yeah. point, it's worth a trade-off. 100%, especially if you know where you're going. You don't need to check bags because there are some hidden fees and stuff with those kind of discount places. But oh, sure. yeah. let's get into Dunning-Kruger and just kind of introduce what we're uh, discussing here. We are going to do a movie review. The Irish movie that I saw, I forget, The Banshees of Whatever, that movie is a 10 out of 10. I loved every second out of it. One of the stupidest, funniest plots I've ever heard. Look, there's a little tease. So let's introduce Dunning-Kruger. Wow. And then we'll take a little side quest later. We'll do because it. it's it's movie season right now. I watched the menu too. What a great movie that was! Yo, funny movie, interesting great. movie. I really like movie. That one and the Banshees of blah blah blah. What Irish island it is? I have no idea. <laughs> They're great <laughs> plots, like very simple, great plots. Okay, so Dunning Kruger is this idea, and everybody's seen TikToks, YouTube's, and read about it. It's this idea that being fairly competent in a, a task or an object or a life skill can create a situation where someone thinks they are elite at it and their confidence does not match their actual abilities it doesn't mean they suck it doesn't mean they won't eventually be renowned what it means is that how good they think they are and how good they actually are is nowhere near the same thing and as a result of that looking at you doctors and lawyers bad things can happen yeah this this is directly related to game theory i think so i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna quote encyclopedia britannica one of my mm. favorite sources uh, and according to britannica the Dunning-Kruger effect in psychology is a cognitive bias whereby people with limited knowledge or competence in a given intellectual or social domain greatly overestimate their own knowledge or competence in that domain relative to objective criteria or the performance of their peers or people in general. So it's a systematic like frame of mind. It's a way of people... Uh, it's a way people kind of see the world and see themselves in relation to some kind of idea or skill set or field or area of expertise. And it's a misperception because it makes people think they're much better at a thing than they are. They really overestimate their abilities. And the way that you know that someone overestimates their abilities is that you can compare that to some other kind of objective standard for like an expert would actually know A, B, and C, right. or an expert would actually be able to perform tasks X, Y, and Z, or the average person is actually just as informed or knowledgeable about this topic as the person in question. And it's related to game theory because we've talked about this on the show left and right, you can do all the math and all the decision-making and all the rationality, and you can calculate all of that out using the actual game theory construct. But one of the big things that makes it interesting, I think, is the inherent biases that people bring with them into the system, whether they know it or not. Yeah. Dunning-Kruger, classic example of how a systematic bias can really result in poor decision-making, can change the outcome of game theory calculations, and really, like, it adds uh, some kind of unfortunate spice, I think, sometimes yeah. to game theory scenarios. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, just based on some of the TikToks and things that I've consumed, that one can become a victim of the Dunning-Kruger effect without knowing it. And also, it's not like being diagnosed with, you know, being a, a sociopath and being a serial killer. Like, people get out of this all the time, and then they look back and they realize, oh, shit, I was, I was wet behind the ears. I had no idea. I mean, sports are a great metaphor. You see a rookie does really well. They come in in their, their sophomore year, and then they don't do so well. Like, yeah, well, now that the big boys got film on you, it's not so easy to just roll out there. you got a long way to go. I, I think that the best way to illustrate the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, and I haven't seen this, 
but I, I like to call it the swoosh graph, right? And the, the swoosh graph, the, the, the Nike swoosh, and this was yeah. a, the, the swoosh graph was a great um, indicator of, of COVID and some other things where you're this, ma- this much confident, high, and then drop to the bottom of the earth once you realize how shitty you are, and then over time, you come back to where you eventually were. So I think that that can often happen. However, with the Dunning-Kruger effect, and this is, I think this is really interesting too, this idea of like decision science is brand new. I think Dunning-Kruger effect was published originally like in the late 90s. Yeah, so the, there's we we were able to find a paper here by David Dunning. So uh, according to Britannica, you know, David Dunning and Justin Kruger were these psychologists who uh, who first kind of like described this effect. And we were able to find a paper at least from 2011. And in the in the abstract of that paper, Dunning kind of describes this this double burden that people have on themselves. What what this like misperception of their own abilities uh, leads them uh, to have to deal with, and. That double burden is, according to him, not only does their <coughs> incomplete misguided knowledge of this task lead them to make mistakes in whatever it is they're doing, but also those deficits prevent them from recognizing that they're making mistakes in the first place. Like they, they, they don't know what they don't know. And as a result, when people make a mistake or they go down the wrong path or they develop improper technique or whatever else, they are actually not aware of the fact that they're going in the wrong direction. It's as if they, it's not that they don't have a math and they're just wandering aimlessly about the terrain. It's that they have the wrong map, they think it's the right map, and they're going completely in the wrong direction. They're never going to find the real destination. And the swoosh, the swoosh graph is, is a, I think, a great model for how to explain it. It's, it's, it's an axis, it's a pair of axes where on the vertical axis you've got like level of confidence in a thing, like how, how self-assured is a person who is dealing in a, in a given field. And on the x-axis you've got how much actual skill or knowledge or expertise does a person have. And the swoosh comes from like the shape of the graph. And what happens is very early on, when people start to learn a new thing about a topic, if they're susceptible to the Dunning-Kruger effect, what happens is when they gain a little bit of knowledge, their confidence goes way, way up. In fact, disproportionate to the amount of knowledge they actually have. Right. Uh, And some people would refer to that on this like kind of amorphous graph as uh, the top of Mount Stupid where a person knows enough to be dangerous but is not aware of what they don't know or their own limitations. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then very shortly after that, once a person is forced to learn often the hard way that their knowledge is limited, that their skill set is not developed, that they don't have the expertise they think they do, they fall down into the valley of ignorance where they realize, oh my goodness, I've been wrong this whole time and I had no idea. And then the swoosh grows like kind of linearly, I guess you could say, as a person learns more and continues to study and continues to persi- persist and, and continues to grow, they become more confident, but they actually pair that confidence with genuine expertise. They actually do learn what they're doing, uh, but it takes much longer and the growth is much slower because you know, they, they're not overestimating themselves. Yeah, they're self-aware of what's going on and as a result yep. of that, they're like, okay, this is a re- my reasonable expectations. There are... Cir- certain circumstances where occasionally, um, whatever the field may be, someone gets in and they pop up and they're not on Mount Stupid. They are just a gifted person. And that that's rare. But I think that those people make the Dunning-Kruger effect possible, if I'm just spitballing here, because I think that the peers of those people are like, oh, well, that guy did it. I can do it. It's like, well, no, that's a once-in-a-generation brain or that's a once-in-a-generation body. Like, you can't. Your goal needs to be you know, slow, steady growth, like a 401k. This person is a genius, you are not. But I think when you compare yourselves to people, then that's where the cognitive bias comes in. Okay, so cognitive bias is something we dabble in. Maybe we should make a cognitive bias uh, subgenre, which is essentially what game theory is, I guess. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it. I mean, and we wouldn't be the first people to make like a cognitive bias, like collection. You can, I think there's a Wikipedia article of like different types of cognitive biases. And um, I'm not saying that's a treasure trove of information for people who are making low-level podcasts about game Mm. theory, but you know, (laughs) we've been there a time or two. And uh, Uh, so so this is just one of the, I, I think this is like a core tenet of cognitive biases because it really represents like what's the most fundamental bias that a person can have it's like well that i'm really great <laughs> and that's pretty easy to internalize i, I think it was uh david foster wallace uh, which say what you want about the guy as yeah, a guy yeah, say what yeah. you want about his author whatever else but he said this thing uh, i can't remember where but he he said ever deep down 
he said everybody has like one thing in common is that we're all united by the fact that like deep down we really do think we are special yeah it's just like well you know of course i have to show how humble i am by saying i'm no better than anybody else but like really secretly like in places you don't talk about at parties you do think you're really special you need to be really special and he said like that's one of the things that we all sort of have in common so like that fundamental uh, bias toward the self to favor the self that leans right into this dunning kruger effect and like you can it, it's it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how a person can get from i'm really great to i'm really great at this specific thing yeah or i know a lot about this specific thing so i think that if we're going to go into some real life examples which i think this would be a good time to do that doctors and lawyers or anybody in the medical field at all is really important because if you're going to deal with human lives for the most part you can get certified um, and become a, a registered nurse I think that I think it's possible to do it in under eighteen months, but for the most part, it's around like the fastest program is one to two years, and then you know there are bachelor of science nurses and whatnot. But other than that, to become someone who treats patients, it takes years and years, and the mm -hmm. amount of memorization is bananas. Our our PAs and our NPs, those are nurse practitioners and physicians assistants, and they're like pseudo doctors. They are like yeah, they're they are like an offensive coordinator or a vice president essentially. So those people take a lot of time as well. And then, of course, um, DOs, PhDs, and MD physicians and people who treat patients, that takes obviously years and years as well. We see that with people in the medical field, they experience that a lot. And doctors would tell you, I have been privy to many of these conversations with many different age group of doctors, that nurses are perhaps the most susceptible to it, um, along with first, second, third year medical students, um, residents who are like, oh, okay, yeah, this is fine. I, I know what's up. And then they get humbled and they get thrown into the valley of suck. And then they're like, okay, but many RNs are never thrown into the valley of suck. They just crush this and then they get to the floor or get to whatever hospital they're at. And they think that they're, there's no, there's nothing to humble them because they're not in charge of any important decisions. So they can just kind of talk shit. Uh, and that's a big problem in nursing. And what, what I love about nurses is that other nurses around the same age group as those nurses hate them, which is funny. That's a fun, it's a fun subgroup to me to talk about. But another famous nurse, example. Nurse gossip would be, nurse gossip would be a, oh. a spectacular show all on its own. I have we could to do a spinoff just about nurse gossip. Yep, exactly. Like how can we, I've, I've, you have no idea how much thought I've put into how can we protect identities and just have people shit talk other people in their industry, nurses and Man. flight attendants. I would love to hear flight attendants talk shit for like hours. Oh, absolutely. The, the stories they must have like Unbelievable. about all the, like think about how irritating the average person is on a yeah, plane. Yeah. Like you, nobody wants to be next to anybody else. And like, think of like half of people are more irritating than that. And the flight attendant is like responsible for dealing with all of that garbage of when like other right. passengers can't. I would love to just listen to those people. Chatham house rules. I just want to hear people talk shit. So, yeah, I would love to do that. So nurses, they, they kind of police themselves, but doctors and stuff, they go through this quite a bit. They'll tell you uh, third-year residency, fourth-year res or uh, third-year med school, fourth-year med school, first-year residency is kind of where this happens. Then you get thrown into the valley of suck, and you're like, okay, now like these are actual human lives, and like it's on me. There is, the cavalry is not coming. I am the cavalry, and then you know they, they climb back up. But there's a very famous example of, I think, something between – psychosis or uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is, of course, with Dr. Death, the neurosurgeon in Texas. Are you familiar with the story? No. You have not watched any documentaries? You don't know who Dr. Death is, the podcast? No. You're a podcaster who doesn't know who Dr. Death is. Sorry, guys. This is, this is not genuine. a true crime guy. This is not a big true crime guy. What? The closest I get to true crime podcasts is uh, I watched Only Murders in the Building. Yeah, that's pretty close. Season one. I haven't seen, I haven't seen season two. But Okay. It just, it just, it's not for me, you guys. And look, that's a defect in my character. I understand that. <laughs> that's a gap me, in my knowledge base. It's a, it's I, it. <laughs> it is. Yeah, you know, I, it is bad. Like, like what do you say? Like in the genres of, of podcasts, there's true crime and then there's everything else. Correct. Uh, as someone, and I've been, I've consulted for people like trying to launch podcasts. It was like, don't like, oh, well they do this on Crime Junkie, the Dateline. Like, yeah, they're dealing with sex and murder. You're not. They can do whatever they want. You will never be as famous as them. Stop it. Like yep. there's, there's a reason. There's a whole section. There's a reason information, like the Discovery Channel has a whole sub channel dedicated to the 48 hours in Dateline. Like this is, we like Freud would hit the nail on the head with that one for sure. Murder porn. Oh, absolutely. So Dr. Death, I'll tell you the story in a nutshell. Essentially, there's a neurosurgeon in Texas. All of his patients are dying or have really bad outcomes. Neurosurgery, the brain and the spinal cord, is really bad. Oftentimes, people can like lose their ability to walk or breathe, and then they die. And so he was killing people, essentially. People that were scrubbing in with him, nurses, other people, uh, 
the, the care team was like, what the fuck is going on? So he got bounced from hospital to hospital. So the story, in a lot of ways, is how the medical system, they didn't cover it up, but they also didn't ring the alarm, which is something you'll see quite of, a, a lot from hospitals. Like the most notorious serial killer, maybe arguably per, perhaps in recorded history, was a nurse in, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and people knew that he was a murderer, and they are like, yeah, just kick him to another hospital. Okay. Fun documentaries on that, too. His name was uh, Charlie Charles Cullen, I think. Yeah, so confirmed 40, uh, scientifically linked to perhaps 400. Ooh, yeah. Okay, anyway. that's, that's bad news. It, like, if you're an order of magnitude more connected to murders than there are confirmed cases, mm -hmm. like, that, that says something about either how difficult it is or how good you were at covering up. Right. Like, evading other people paying attention and, like, pursuing you as a murderer correct and that's kind of what happened and then people that found out they're like yeah just fire him and get him out of here um anyway so dr death in texas he's in texas he trains at tennessee while he's training he wants to publish he wants to create patents and everybody at this university of tennessee which was in memphis they want to be along for the ride they want credit for this guy they want to do all this stuff so he never really learns how to do neurosurgery Everyone thinks he's a genius because you can be a genius and he was a hard worker and he was smart he did have this some is ringing bells Yes. Yep. This is ringing bells now. Yeah, yep. that's right. That's right. Yeah. No, you, I, I think, I feel like you and your wife have talked to us about this. Yes. Like we, we must have had a conversation about this yep. at some point over a bunch of beers. So exactly right. So then he goes and he takes a practice in Dallas and he just is allowed to do surgery. And then there's a part of this where he gets so cocky and defensive of his skills and ability. And then he starts tooting his own horn and all this stuff. And meanwhile, all these people he's operating on are like, not only did they not have a surgery, what they had done to them was nowhere near what the surgery was supposed to be. He didn't use the right instruments. He ends up like essentially decapitating his own friend who had like a neck thing. He has neck hurt. So he wanted neck surgery and the guy like couldn't walk and then eventually died from his injuries. He's a murderer. He's in prison for murder. Yikes. But I think that part of this is just like a little bit of personality disorder, but a lot of Dunning-Kruger where he just like figured everyone kissed his ass at Memphis. So he thought that he was a genius. The system didn't take care of it. There was no like because in most most medical residencies you get beat up pretty bad. You have to they they make sure that you know it's like the military. He never went through that because they thought he was going to be you know the the golden ticket in terms of patents and money and stuff. Mm -hmm. So they and then they never warned anybody. So instead of checking him, they just let him stay on top of Mount Stupid and then he murdered people. Well, if you, know, you got to have some place to throw the bodies off of. Yeah, yeah, top for of sure. Mountain, to extend the metaphor a little. Bit. Wow, mm -hmm. that's. That's wild. It, so, so you think it was a combination of this guy, like possibly personality disorder, but this dude was just like so deep into sniffing his own farts, so hopped up on his own like ability to just pull off this genius level like Persona. surgery. Yeah. Yep. Wow. But he went through the training and they passed him, but like he couldn't. He like they, everyone knew knows he never learned it. So it's not a one to one of like you can perform. It's like that. Uh, I remember. I remember when we were going through school. It was there was like a huge concern about like teaching to the test. Mm -hmm. Like you're not really teaching life skills. You're teaching to pass the test. Like well, you know, if the test has stuff on there that you need to know, then that's fine. But if you can pass the test without really having the expertise to do the work of right. being a surgeon, then that's a problem. Right, and that's that's essentially what happened. And then once you get out of that system, a lot of people will do a lot of uh, cover your own ass. Right, CYA baby, mm, CYA, I, and they all did. If I ever Dallas. get, it, I, I hope to get some, uh, get those letters behind my name as a profession. You hear people is like, <laughs> like CPA, yeah, I'm certified, but like MDS or DDS or whatever. I hope, to, I hope to get Chris Andrews CYA. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that, that would be pretty sweet. People just ask oh, yeah. what it is, like, oh, if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. Like, it's yeah. just a really and niche you thing. You, if you don't know what it is, you can't afford me. You can't, you can't, you can't, yeah, exactly. If you don't know what it is, you cannot afford me. So I do think that it was personality disorder. There was some stuff in the story, like how yeah. he transferred from a DT football school to Colorado State. And there was an anecdote from the linebacker's coach where he was trying to play linebacker where he just couldn't understand how to fill the gap. And he kept like staying out there and working on it, working on it, but he just did not understand how to flow to the hole, which is like this is deep football lingo. He didn't this understand is also how to hilarious to hear. Like outside of football context, this is hilarious. Yeah. A, a college a college bro doesn't know how to fill the gap. A college bro <laughs> doesn't know how to flow to the hole. Are you kidding me? Yeah, and he didn't. He definitely did not know how to flow to the hole, and that was part of it too. And he's like dealing drugs, like like yeah. I mean, is he just story. like a yoked out like super fast dude? Because like, how do you get to play college ball without knowing how to play the game? He worked really. His his thing is that he worked really hard. He just wasn't good at anything. He's really good <laughs> at making it seem like he was good at shit. Yeah. You ever watch Bro Science? You ever seen those videos? I, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. But yeah. I've seen with what, Bro Science. I saw the, a CrossFit one where he's like, it's the difference between building a house and getting really good at hammering nails into a board. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> well, if you work really hard and you can't have any results about it, like, it's like yeah. well, I, I had a professor say like, oh yeah, well I worked really hard on this topic, and so well we're not collecting buckets of sweat. Yep. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, if you work really hard and it doesn't produce results, like you got to change. Change the way you're working here. You and I used to get in arguments with people that in our high school, because our high school had a really renowned cheerleading team. We used to get in arguments with people that wanted cheerleading to be a sport, and they're like, it's really a lot harder than, like, golf or whatever. It's like, well, first of all, no. Skill is a different thing. But second of all, climbing Mount Everest is hard. It's not a fucking sport. I didn't, like, of course it's hard. Gymnastics is hard, and I don't think it's gym. gymnastics is a sport. I think it's a different thing, but we will fight about that. I think, it's, I think it's sport. It's not yes. a sport. It's sporting. It's not a sport. And, like, that's yeah. what the argument that it's we hard. would have. Because it was hard, they were like, "Well, it's hard." Like, okay, I don't care if it's hard. Digging ditches is super hard. Yeah, not a sport. I, I mean, yeah, no, it's 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 absolutely not a sport, and it, it doesn't doesn't take anything away from it. But I, I was I want to I want to actually connect this back to like the last episode we were talking about. So, yeah. as you know, I know the Tion sister wise, mm-hmm. big sister wise guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've continued watching in in the week since we aired our last episode. Oh yeah, uh, and recently there's a plot line where like I won't I won't discuss the medical details because this is stuff that happened years ago. This happened to you know like one of their kids. So, but their kid had like a skeletal muscular or like a musculoskeletal uh, issue that needed correction, and eventually correction was going to have to resu- like be the result of a surgery. And like it's really you know, it's like a major invasive surgery to correct a fundamental problem. But this family was so like. Okay, any parent wouldn't want their kid to go through surgery. No parent wants that for their child, yeah. period. But this family was intent on doing stuff like, oh, well, we found this alternative medicine that they say like, oh, yeah, they actually reversed irreversible damage. Oh, great. Like they, actually, they actually prevented progress in a situation where progress was inevitable. And so they like pay more money to this camp of people that's like, oh yeah, no, we, we, we it won't make any guarantees, but this alternative is like different from all the experts and whatever else. And it's, it's easier. You don't have to have surgery. Right. It'll cost you less. And at the end of the day, it's just people lying about their level of expertise and their ability to actually address and solve a problem. Like, so the family and like a spoiler alert, this happened years ago. Uh, they end up going through the surgery because that's what's mm-hmm. medically necessary. Yeah. They also go through this like alternative, like they call it a boot camp, and they send the kid to like two weeks of physical therapy, and it does, of course, it does nothing. It's nonsense. But these people were so intent on like, oh yeah, no, like the conclusion that the expert has reached is one that I don't like. I don't feel yeah. comfortable with the result that the expert is telling me is inevitable. Denial. So I'm going to pursue yeah. another result. Denial and, and so, addiction are two of the most profitable uh, scams out there. If you can profit off of denial and addiction, you'll you'll be set. That's like billionaire money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and it's like, it, so so we're not trying to make this a political show. This is not no. a political show. No. Uh, but I do want to. Well, uh, politics are a big part of this. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, huge. Huge. Yeah. Absolutely. Because because the Dunning Kruger effect speaks to I think the way people form their worldviews. Like, everybody brings biases to the table. It's just sure. a question of determining what those biases are and being intellectually honest about them with yourself and with everybody else. And there's this book by a guy named Tom Nichols. Uh, he wrote it a few years ago. It's called The Death of Expertise. Mm. And the point of this book is that for whatever reason in America, whether it's because we have, like, echo chambers on social media or because we've been, you know, too fat and happy without having to, like, fight a war or go through sacrifice or tough economic times for so long, for whatever reason... We have this system that allows us to play to our worst strengths, which is narcissism, self-obsession, the desire to be right, the desire to be heroic when we're bored. All of those things can just get cultivated in this nasty, like, fungus ecosystem. And we can just continue to self-reinforce these worst biases about ourselves. And one of the results of it is, as you might expect from the title, people who are genuine experts, who have put in actual work and actual study and developed actual skill in highly specialized, highly technical, highly challenging fields, from science to engineering to construction to medicine, you name it. Mm-hmm. The, people, the expertise that those people have developed over a period of years is completely undermined because idiots can hop on Twitter and yep. just say you're wrong and agree with other people who say the experts are wrong, and then they feel good about it. And like they craft this entirely different worldview. And I think the the fundamental bias that's driving that is either the same as or not dissimilar to the Dunning-Kruger effect. Someone yeah. says like, oh, I read a book about this once, or I saw someone else tweet about this once. And somehow that is supposed to, like that gives them the confidence 
to think that they are somehow equivalent to or more informed than actual experts who are saying things that don't necessarily sound at, like, like they're not as sexy. They're not as appealing. They're not yeah. as easy to stomach. So I think that's one of the really negative consequences of, of the Dunning Kruger effect. And it's not just like a personal thing. I, it, it's like a whole yeah. of society problem in a place where that kind of yeah. bias can well, really I have, I have, so I have a couple of thoughts on, on what you're saying. The first is that I think that for the first time in human history, the gap, so we're going to do an episode about how perhaps science is not moving as quickly as it used to move. It's moving incrementally now at this point. But I think the gap between the average working member of society, bachelor's degree or not, and experts is getting to a point where it is exponentially bigger than it has ever been. So I think a farmer in the 1700s knew much closer to the amount of information about the entire world as Benjamin Franklin, as someone who is a lay person in a field does to like a physician now, because we know so much about so many things and so many fields are so focused that, and we see this play out with COVID is like, well, it's kind of like the flu. It's like, yes, but you you don't know the same way that these other people know. They put in the years of work, and it's not that simple. I also think, and I, there's a fascinating documentary about uh, the Flat Earther movement. I think a lot of this has to do with boredom and loneliness, and I think that I call it the what-if complex, where a lot of people that fall prey to this are just like, yeah, well, what if that thing that it was true just wasn't? Like, well, that's actually really fucking exciting. That'd be really fun if that was true. Yeah. Like, how, what a great, grandiose thing. If the Earth was flat like a saucer, that'd be so much fun. And then you could drive yourself like, this is the thing I'm looking forward to when I wake up in the morning because my life is, is not going the way I want it to or I'm just bored and lonely. And so you can create a community out of those people. And if, if, it's, if it's innocent, it's adorable, but then eventually you dabble into it and all of a sudden you're denying the Holocaust happened. Yeah, it really is like a snowballing effect to get yeah. from what if this happened to like all of a sudden, like I'm the alt-right and yep. you, know, you, you get like Kanye Wests and stuff. And that's one of the things that Tom Nichols says in his book. It's like, well, a lot of this comes from just genuine boredom. Like yep. people, for whatever reason, are not fulfilled enough by having a normal, healthy, boring family at a normal, healthy, boring job and a normal, healthy, boring, well-adjusted life. And in that boredom, when people like, I also heard on this uh, on this other podcast by this priest uh, named uh, uh, Mike Schmidt, he said like a, a lot of times people's problems like get exacerbated when their sphere of interest, like the things that they try to learn about, far exceeds their sphere of influence. So like mm -hmm. the more time people spend like reading about like nationwide news stories or like global catastrophes or whatever, or like I don't know secret societies and conspiracies that may or may not be real, right. the more time they spend consuming stuff like that, the more intense their feelings get about things that they have no ability to control, and. One of the consequences of that is that their boring life starts to look really unappealing and is unsatisfying in comparison to like what may be out there, what potential could be out there. Like, what if we get to the bottom of this and we discover all the secrets that they don't want us to know? And all it takes is just some courageous patriots to stand up and do the right thing. And all of a sudden, when people start acting on that, they're injecting an unhealthy dose of genuine delusion into a society that's already got enough challenges. And one of the main problems I think here is that all of this stuff feels like critical thinking, like conspiracy thinking yeah. feels like it's critical thinking no because like you are using a lot of the basic skills, like people who learn stuff, you know, it, like you don't get that level of confidence that's described in the Dunning Kruger effect without actually learning a thing or two. You have to have some level of knowledge about the topic yeah. or, or area of interest. Yeah, of course. But, but the problem is, the, the the premises that result of the assumptions you have to make to fill in the gap for the knowledge that you don't have or the mistakes that you make for the skills that you have not developed, all of that puts you on really unstable, unshaky ground. And in the case of like conspiracists, that shaky ground is so unstable as to be like utter nonsense. And that's when you start thinking like, well, you know, if the earth was flat, then a, B, C, D, E, F, G. And you like follow this logical chain of conclusion. So you use this base level of skill to do a dangerous and stupid thing, but it feels like you're doing the right thing. It yeah. seems like you're applying the right skills. It's, it's as we said earlier, like it's not that you don't have a map and you're trying to find your way. It's that you have the wrong map, but you think it's the right one. Yeah. Well, that's uh, the Mark Twain quote. Um, it's not what you don't know that'll get you killed. It's what you know for sure. That just ain't true. Yeah. Whatever. Exactly. Like that. I would like to, a yeah. point of order, a point of order. I would like to return to something that you said. Did you say conspiracists? So we're not giving these people credit for being conspirators. Um, is that your motion, conspiracists? Yeah, 
Yeah, so so this, the distinction is subtle, and I appreciate your point. So conspirators yeah. are people, I think, that are involved in a conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. Alex, Jones, Alex Jones is a conspirator. conspirator. He yes. knew what he said was bullshit. Yes, and the law now demonstrates that. Right. And the punishment that he's had to face demonstrates that. Conspiracists are people who, Consume like, that's like their reach far exceeds their grasp. Yeah, yeah. And they're, like, they're consumers of it, and they, like, they propagate the ideas, but, like, they're not involved in plots to, like, you remember that plot to, like, kill the Michigan governor and, like, yeah. overthrow the government of the <laughs> state of Michigan? Like, yeah. those people are conspirators. Yeah. The people who believe in that kind of thing without saying, like, no, this is ridiculous or these people are wrong, uh, those people are conspiracists. Sure. Okay. I yeah, that, that that's, makes that's, that makes that's sense. my terminology. I don't right. know. It seems right to me. Yeah, and I think I, I think that that's that's so true. Um, this, this idea that you can go down the rabbit hole and there's like the Dunning Kruger effect. It's weird that you you never think that this would be how this happens because there's a lot of hunky dory just general incompetence that can be chalked up to the Dunning Kruger effect. And we started with medicine. I would like to say that um, the the gap between the uh, Mount Stupid and the Valley of Suck or whatever it's called, um, Valley of Ignorance. <laughs> the I Valley think of is Ignorance. The more- the fun term. It, it kind of reminds me, and I've, I've often thought about this because I've been working in medicine and, and adjacent to medical fields for a long time. The best possible thing that you could have for your care is an elite nurse who's super good. And no matter what the age, no matter what the experience, like that is because those people with their gut feelings and they've seen a million cases and they know stuff, like a, a nurse with a gut feeling who's been there for 20 years is an asset that for, for you as a hospitalized person, you can't, that's just luck of the draw. That's an amazing thing. But the worst thing that can happen on your care team is having a Dunning-Kruger nurse. So the gap, nurses alone are like the, the peak from, from the mountain of something that's being successful in the valley of ignorance, like that and those people have the same position. They probably make the same amount of money. And just because of this this inability to, like, and I know that this says this on Wikipedia, and this, this metacognition, thinking about what you're thinking about, understanding yourself and your place, that can be the difference. And for, you know, for medical people, it can have real results. But I want to talk to uh, you about stuff that's funny and, I guess, some semi-serious but also kind of stupid. Politicians and marketers are also susceptible to the Dunning-Kruger effect. Filmmakers, really susceptible to the Dunning-Kruger effect, to the point where I think you can start to predict flops in a fucking hilarious way. How's that? Well, because after a certain point in time, directors had a lot of success, say, in the 90s and early 2000s, to put something out now and be like, well, people, they just go on their phones. Like, no, dude, you sucked. No, no one wants to see this fucking movie. <laughs> Sorry, I don't yeah. know what to tell you. So, yeah, your movies used to be great when it cost me five fifty to go to the theater. And now that it cost me $48 to go see a movie, I am no longer interested in the sequel to Avatar. Right. Ex- exactly. I, like, I don't know what to tell you, man. Right. But that was a successful. I forget. Was it Ridley I know, Scott? It's crazy. Was Ridley Scott was the guy that did um, Gladiator, I think. Oh, shoot. I don't know. He, whoever directed let's, Gladiator let's and Blade Runner. Yeah, let's find this out. And then we're going to talk about the, um, the movies that we want to review. And then we're going to do some more Dunning-Kruger. Because it's like Martin. I'm not a, not a true crime guy. I'm also not a big, uh, not a big film buff. And it was, kind of. and you were. That's you were a right. lie. Is it really Scott? Okay, so well, I, yeah, because I we know did the trivia. movies. I know we did trivia at the fucking thing, and you knew all of the movies. We got the movie around co- completely correct, and no one contributed at all. That was a little bit weird. I attribute that to being friends with, uh, as we said at the top of the show, people who are terminally online. Uh, I know enough of the references. I was able to get it. And uh, shout out to a, a friend of mine, Lucy. Mm, Big film buff, Lucy. huge. Like, but here's the difference. Like, so perfect example. Lucy is a person who has done film school, who is a professional yeah. filmmaker, who knows movies back to front, who knows what constitutes good and bad. Her taste is better than mine because it's much more informed, and it's like there's actual expertise there. Uh, so I attribute it to you know being friends with with people like her. But uh, the Gladiator was directed by Ridley Scott. He so, directed something. Uh, he directed something with a bunch of A list celebrities: Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, somewhere like that. I don't remember. And it was about even Adam Driver. I think was in this. It was about the last duel. I think it might have been called the last duel. It was a duel in France about like adultery or rape or something. In the oh, 1890s. oh, you're thinking you're thinking of the House of Gucci. Uh, yeah, totally. No, I'm just kidding. There, so yeah, so he did he did a movie called Last Duel, and that also has Adam Driver in it. Yep. It has Matt Damon in it, Ben Affleck. It was a uh, <laughs> Jodie Comer. <laughs> And he was like, these people are on their phones. Like, no, bro. Like, you thought that you were still a good filmmaker. You're not anymore. You were. You didn't adapt to us. Our tastes change. Meanwhile, I got people starting to understand, like we were talking about with the menu, that horror is back. Comedy horrors are back. And that talks about our psychosis and what we experienced in the 70s because that was a dark time too, which is what's happening now. Get Out, I think, was probably the film that ushered us into that era. But the menu was one of the greatest plots I've ever seen. And then it's called The Banshees of Inishirin. And do you want to know the plot? Yeah, I do. Okay, so it's a it's a remote island 
in Northern Ireland, very close to the border of Northern Ireland and Ireland, and it's in the 20s during the Irish Civil War. On the island, there are like... 20s? I think it, whatever it was, 30s, I don't know. It was the 1900s is when this was set. So the plot is, of the 70 people on this island, they all kind of know each other, right? This guy who is best, like Colin Farrell? Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell plays a guy who is best friends with kind of his neighbor, and that guy's, his neighbor is played by whoever else was in, with, with, in Bruges with him. His neighbor wakes up one day, and he's about 20 years older than Colin, and he's just like, I don't like you anymore. And, like, the, uh, to the what? point where he's like, I don't want to talk to you. We're not friends. And he, at one point, threatens, if you speak to me again, I'm going to cut off one of my own fingers. That's very bizarre. And it is one of the greatest. And, the guy, and Colin's like, what the fuck? What, why don't you like me anymore? We were best friends. And the whole movie is just him trying to figure out why they're best friends. It was one of the greatest movies hmm. I've ever seen. Okay. I might, I might go back and watch that. Okay. But I haven't seen and it. And the, the menu. <clears throat> did you, you watch the menu. Yeah, I did watch the menu. That was a that was a good one. I, I kept thinking of uh, man, that guy is always going to be Voldemort to me. Like spectacular actor. What's his name? Uh, something Fines. Fine. Yeah, Ben Fines. Ben Fine, something like that. Oh, I don't know. No, we can do it. We can power it through. Let's give ourselves five seconds. Ralph Fines. Ralph Fines nailed it. Yep, Ralph Fines nailed it. Uh, he's, always gonna Harry, he's always going to be Harry. He's always going to be Voldemort to me. Really? I, 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 man, I don't um, have to tell you. Yeah, well, Grand Budapest Hotel is like my favorite movie of all time, so he'll always be that guy, which is a great uh, character. I keep wanting to say that guy's name is Gaston, but it's not. <laughs> Gaston, basically. He's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what it is. Okay, he looks so like a Gaston. Other people that are susceptible to Dunning-Kruger are marketers, and they'll, they'll pitch these ideas for these campaigns, and they'll be like, look at all the success I've had, and then they'll come out. You ever see a commercial that blows? Off the top of my head, I can only remember commercials that are good, which is kind of the point of this. They're ne- the commercials that blow, you see them on TV, and you're like, I, I know what you're going for. And I Capital can't one. believe, but if you think deeper about the yeah, Capital One's a great one. Worst commercials If you think in the deeper, world. or they have those cafes. Remember Capital One cafes? Those exist. Oh, yeah. I've seen two of them. It's embarrassing. It, there's a bank and a cafe, bro. What, what the, f- and they put them in cities where there's like actual coffee and stuff? No. It's the worst what? manifestation of like misunderstanding what millennials wanted. Right. But this is exactly what I'm talking about. If you think deeper about marketing campaigns, there was a meeting, there was a pitch, someone had an idea, there were products, there was a whole fucking thing. The person who pitched Capital One's uh, cafe banks, that person is Dunning Kruger. Uh, they could be fifty. They could be in the career for 50 years. Have the confidence to say, you know what people want is to bank where they drink their coffee and unwind. And we, you know what? We should totally get them on our Wi-Fi too. That'll be great. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Like, I can't believe that somebody like followed this all the way through. Like, oh yeah, no. This guy really knows what he's doing. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And they pitch it, and someone's like, yeah, well, this guy, look at his resume. He's done all this stuff. Dunning-Kruger, it can keep happening to you. Yes, it, it comes comes for us all. So I, I think it might be worth worth discussing just a little bit, yeah. some potential solutions. And I, I, I really can only think of one possible antidote to the Dunning-Kruger oh, nice. effect. Dunning Kruger. And I think this could be a good moment for, for us, for the show, for to be a little bit a little bit transparent with our, with our audience. So I, I think... The genuine antidote to Dunning Kruger uh, is just humility. Yeah, I think you have to have genuine, actual, no kidding humility, and that includes not just like humility isn't just like I constantly underestimate myself or I like publicly undercut my abilities in a thing. It's not. It's not speaking about less about yourself. It's about thinking about yourself less, and so like become like. The, the, the fundamental bias that you have to address, I think, isn't I'm great at this thing. It's that I'm great in general. Where do we go from yep. here? Yep. So that's that's really and like and like look for for us, I think I think we can be real for a second here. One of our bits on this show is we self deprecate. We yeah. self deprecate with the best of them. We make jokes, it's kinda of funny. We're also Those not us, experts in fucking any of this. Not a single bit of it. So like while some of that's performative because it's kind yeah. of, you know, it, it moves conversation along right. and our friends and family who know us are actually are like, yeah, there's a little bit more truth to the, like the kind of jokiness than mm. they would like to. Admit. Yeah. I actually do suck at math. I didn't try hard at all. Yeah. No, that's like, that's not like we couldn't make that up. Not but so the, the real solution to the Dunning Kruger effect is to like actually be honest. Like we're, we're not purporting yeah. to be experts here. Uh, by any stretch, because like we genuinely don't know enough about this stuff beyond like the little bit of research we do for each topic episode. We're not even game theory. Like we didn't study game theory in college. Like we barely studied economics. No. So it's. It, I think the important thing here is like to go back to the book I mentioned. One of the consequences of like okay, expertise is dying. Well, how do you restore 
expertise. Like you have to re- restore trust in expertise and understand like when I go to a doctor, I don't know more about that doctor. My alternative medicine that my friend told me about at our like club meeting isn't going to be better than this guy's, I don't know, decades of whatever. Like a, 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 a somebody who knows... I don't know, like my friend Lucy, like she knows film better than I do. Yeah. We like different stuff, but that's not because I'm like, oh yeah, well she just doesn't understand the subtlety. Like, no, I'm the one that doesn't understand the subtleties of film. I'm the yes. one with bad taste. Yeah, and I think that that there, there are examples. If you ever see a real expert in their field, and that it's like it's a completely different thing. We talked about the Malcolm Gladwell example with 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 uh, dining and, and fine yep. eating, eating people and. Um, some are the people. same way. Eat, like people they're, eat. They're, they're professional eaters. They're not. They're, yeah. they're probably chefs, but like they're they're eaters, right? Yes. They're consumers. food critics. They're food critics. Some are are kind of the same thing. We're like, yeah. It, most of those who are genuine experts are so unpronounced about it that you would have no idea that they have this absurd skill. Like you would look at them and you'd be like, whatever. Like, yeah, that guy's actually top seven in this thing. And then it's taken him twenty years to get there because they're so very off. They're off brand about it. I I I remember an interview with Jonah Hill and Bill Simmons on Bill Simmons's dumb show that he launched it, yeah, on HBO for one for mm-hmm. for like a, a year and he had I wanted to watch it Jonah Hill which had just done Moneyball and so Jonah Hill comes on and they're talking about sports the idea is you get these famous people and whatever and then Bill Simmons asked Jonah Hill like well you like movies and the look on his face cuz he he got it he wasn't offended or anything but the look on his face and he said something along the lines of that's my life and like the power that I I I saw that and what he's telling me is like I, yeah, I know every. I have seen shit you can't possibly understand. I've I know the boom operators' names. I know film. So the, the for me and you, we have access to films. So we're like, I think that the acting is this. And Jonah Hill's like, I that's that's my livelihood. That's yes. how that's my entire being is watching this shit because these experts can come across like they don't watch every movie, but they do. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that's that, that that kind of that kind of honesty where it's not like somebody is flouting their expertise, but it's clear that they had like being that honest is you can only facilitate that if you are genuinely humble about a thing. And like as I said, humility doesn't mean uh, underplaying or underselling any of that. And like Jonah Hill didn't do that. Like he's on, right. like no, he knows what he's talking about, but he doesn't have to be in anybody's face about it. And he doesn't have to like he doesn't have to fake it because he's actually made it. But you know, you do have to like, like the advice like fake it till you make it. That's that's enabling Dunning Kruger people. Yeah, because sometimes is. you get so Literally lost the in the playing of like oh I'm pretending I know as much as like Jonah Hill about film or as much as like your wife about doctoring. Like mm-hmm. y- y- you have to be y- you have to be realistic about your own abilities. And like, I think the, the, the fundamental bias to overcome is like the, the desire to constantly support oneself or think oneself is better than everybody else. Like you, you gotta, you gotta get over that. You gotta move past you it. You gotta watch and, these guys defer to other people too. We just yes. mentioned my wife where she's like, compared to me and you, she's an expert compared to people in her oh, yeah. field. She's not. And they will even the greatest cardiac surgeon or the greatest microbiologist or immunologist be like, hey, I'm an immunologist. I'm not, I have no idea what to tell you about personality disorders. That's this person over here. It's like, well, you studied them. Like, yeah, I memorized the shit in med school for sure. They, and they're, yeah, they're, 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 they will do that. They're so one, have you ever seen The Queen's Gambit? Did you watch one episode? Yeah, I watched I watch a few episodes of The Queen's, okay. Queen's Gambit. So in The Queen's Gambit, I think a lot, you and I have a lot in common in that there's this um, montazization. I don't care. Yeah, they kind of... Yeah, montage but through like, like the they, good parts. They fast forward through the hard work it takes to yeah. become an expert, which was Magnus Carlsen's critique of the movie or the show also. But one thing that I think that the film does illustrate really well is in the very first episode um, with Bill Camp, who's one of the great, the bald guy, the guy that was oh, the yeah. janitor. When he makes her resign and yells at her, I think that is exactly how you, you go about the Dunning-Kruger, where he's like, the game is over, and I have you. There is nothing. You're, it's insulting to me to keep playing. Like, lay down your lay down your king. And I think that's exactly the 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 way to get over this. Like it's you lose sometimes. You yeah, get it like, wrong, and that's okay. Oftentimes, like the conclusions that you want to be true just aren't. Yeah. Like you you have to get over that, and you have to be willing to accept. Like you have to have the mental agility to be able to pivot and like still understand the world, even though the thing you wanted isn't going to be or the result right. that you were hoping for has not come to pass. Right. And that, that takes, that takes like intellectual skill. But ultimately, I mean, humility is like the, is the, the panacea here for, for all your ales, <laughs> all your Dunning Kruger ales. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You like that? Yeah. That's a, not even a classicist. I know that word. Totally know what that is. Not going to look that up. You know what I learned about that? Myself. Rush song. That's what, that's one of the things I like about Rush too is like, okay, look, 
I've done my best not to talk about Rush very much on this show, but yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna give him credit for the in a documentary Beyond the Lighted Stage. Uh, the, somebody points. I think it's the guy from uh, Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, he points out like you know they they never really like they they're intellectual like Neil Peart's smarter than everybody that he was ever around because he read yeah. books and he was with a bunch of rock stars and roadies and he like but they like, like they didn't like alienate the common person and they, like their philosophy was like well people are just as smart as we are and like yeah. the Dunning Kruger effect leads you to like assume well I'm better than this person at this or I know more than these other people around me these fools who aren't as informed they're not in the inner sanctum like I am like well no like if you're honest with yourself and if you're a humble person you can recognize people are just as smart as I am people can people can figure this out just as much as we like the only difference between us and people who are listening to this show is that we're the dipshits with microphones who happen to have published this episode. Yeah. Like, no, like, like, we, we don't know any more than anybody Literally. else. Uh, so, I, am an expert, I am an expert in getting podcasts from my brain to the internet. That I am an expert in that. Yeah, that's genuine I skill. You actually have done you that. Like, you, you've Thousands actually like, made a career out of that. Yes. But, but uh, you know, yeah, no, content, I'm, I'm with you. If you want to Google a fun, a fun YouTube is Joe Rogan getting humbled. He's got a guest on and he's because he does. He, he dabbles in conspiracy theories and he has guests on. He had, and to his credit, he's very often defers to the experts. He's just asking questions. Right. Well, I mean, I don't know about that, but the people that are on are often experts in things. And one time he said to a guy, did you know this? And the guy's like, no, that's not true. And they looked it up and Joe's like, huh, my bad. The guy's like, mm-hmm. that's right. And what you, that's what you got to do. Sometimes you lay down your fucking king so you don't kill someone in neurosurgery. See, this episode is relevant to everybody. Everybody. What's the worst that could happen if I don't get this podcast? Well, we're, that makes us the greatest podcasters of all time or the worst podcasters of all time? Well, I mean, it's definitely one of those two, and I'll give you a hint. It is not the first one. It is not. That, that's up to the people to decide for us. That's right. Or the person. Thank you. Ooh, the person.